right. Um, good afternoon and welcome. I'm very excited to see you all for today's lecture. For those who don't know me, I'm the Mount's Executive Director, Susan Whistler, and it's just great to see you all. Um, before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. Mosquitoes, yes, we have them, so if you need bug spray and you haven't sprayed up yet, just raise your hand and we'll bring you a little packet of, an, of, of stuff. Um, following the lecture, there will be a book signing in that corner of the tent. And lastly, please turn off your cell phones. Um, I'd also like to share two of our upcoming programs this week, um, this Wednesday at 4. I hope you'll join us right here in the tent for True Conversations. It will be an amazing hour as Best American Short Story editor Heidi Pittler delves deep into the writing life of New York Times bestselling author Meg Wolitzer. Uh, and Heidi will be asking questions not typically asked of female authors, and they will both get to the core of what it means to be a fiction writer today. So I promise you it will not be the standard book talk. And this Thursday at 5, we'll, we will be hosting the first of our brand new music series, Concerts in the Dell, which will be taking place on the sort of grassy knoll just beyond the stable. Our first musician is the wonderful clarinetist Paul Green, whose interest in jazz and Jewish music has led him to create his own compositions of uh, jazz klezmer fusion. Um, these concerts will be in the Dell each Thursday this August. Uh, Soma will be the, be the food caterer. They have a wonderful food truck. The Mount will be selling beer, wine, and other beverages. Um, seating is on the lawn, so please bring your own blankets and chairs. The weather forecast looks great, and I think it will be a casual but classy evening. Um, now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's author. Maggie Doherty teaches writing at Harvard, where she also earned her PhD in English. Her writing has appeared in numerous publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times, The New York Review of Books, and The Nation. The Equivalence is Maggie's first book, and it was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Bravo. Praise for The Equivalence was swift and torrential. Harper's Magazine called it, quote, rich and powerful. The Los Angeles Times hailed it as brilliant. The Wall Street Journal praised it for being written with panache. And the Minneapolis Star Tribune described it as a, quote, important illuminating work, as well as a splendidly written page turner to read. So please join me in welcoming Maggie Darty. Thank you so much, Susan, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone at the Mount for coordinating this visit, especially to Patricia Pinn. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here. This is actually my first in-person book event. This book came out in May of 2020. Um, so yeah, it's, it's such a thrill to actually be able to be in person gathering um, with so many of you and to have an exchange in person rather than over Zoom. Very exciting for me and I hope for you as well. So I thought what I would do is talk for a little bit about the book, but then move on pretty quickly to talking about a few things kind of around the book. So I thought I would talk a little bit about how I came to write this story and why. Um, a little bit about the research process, particularly about one kind of moving and exciting find in the archive. I don't know if any of you are, are arch archivists or librarians. Um, I'm always really grateful to work with archivists and librarians, and one of the reasons is because they introduced me to all kinds of interesting sources that I can use. And then I wanted to end by saying a little bit about why I write history. I'm not a trained historian. I was trained as a literary scholar. But I found myself writing a lot of historical and biographical work in my writing career. And I wanted to speak a little bit about how I think about that and how I approach that, especially when it comes to writing women's history, which can be sort of a tricky and challenging um, process for writers, especially given some of what I would say is the sort of amnesia we have <laughs> um, generally about history, but particularly about women's history. So that's what I'm going to do. And then I will be very, very happy to take questions about any aspect of the book or the writing process, anything that you're interested in. So the equivalence. Um, it is the story of a group of friends and artistic collaborators. These women were the poets, Anne Sexton and Maxine Cuman, best friends, uh, both lived in Newton, and were often called the poets whenever they went places because they seemed so, so similar, although they were actually very different. The writer Tilly Olson, 
the, paper Barbara, the painter Barbara Swan and the sculptor Mariana Pineda. These five women met in the early 1960s at the Radcliffe Institute for Independent Study, a fellowship program described by its founder, Mary Ingraham Bunting, who was then the president of Radcliffe, as a messy experiment in women's higher education. Bunting was a scientist by training. She was actually a microbiologist. And she had this hypothesis, which was that if women academics and artists were given more institutional support at the middle of their careers, they would produce great art and scholarship. She also believed that most women wanted to combine career and family and that a part-time academic life was ideal. This would go on to be challenged in some ways by the very uh, uh, experiment that she, that she conducted. Bunting came to her ideas about women's education and ambition in part through her own experience as a scientist and a mother. During her graduate studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Bunting met and married her husband, Henry Bunting, a fellow graduate student. The couple had four children. When her husband started a medical residency at Yale, Bunting gained access to Yale's labs. A few days a week, she'd travel from Bethany, Connecticut to New Haven, continue the research she'd started at graduate school. The rest of the time, she gardened, raised animals, made meatloaf, and cared for her children. There are these really, uh, one of my favorite anecdotes actually from reading up uh, about Mary Ingraham Bunting, Polly, to her friends, is that she loved to garden topless. This was Connecticut in you know, the 1940s, but she would put little band-aids over, <laughs> over her, her more sensitive uh, parts. And um, you know, so she. So I think, as as, as you might uh, understand from that anecdote, she was in some ways, you know, conventional. She was on a particular path toward toward marriage and motherhood, and really loved. She actually really loved making meatloaf. But she also had a kind of unconventional streak, uh, as as evidenced by her gardening habits. Um, but so, but these these years were really idyllic for her. They were really wonderful. She was, she was raising animals, she was playing with her children, and then several, several days a week she was getting to conduct pretty serious research. And she thought this was perfect and that all women deserved a similar experience. Her husband died rather suddenly and she had to make a career change. She ended up getting into university administration, basically through a friend of a friend of a friend. And she ended up becoming the dean of Douglas College, which was the women's college at Rutgers University. What she observed as a dean reinforced her ideas about women's domestic and intellectual lives. She noticed that her female undergraduates were obsessed with marriage and dating. And this was pretty standard behavior for the 1950s. Um, she thought that you know, if women were going to marry young, which they were, and have multiple children, but then be done with the very difficult and intensive phase of child rearing by the time they were in their 30s, then the current model of education, of higher education, wasn't really working because you would need to kind of continue through higher education during those childbearing and child rearing years. And that wasn't really making sense for the women that she observed as dean. Instead, she thought that women's education needed to adjust to this particular life pattern. That in her words, there needed to be off ramps and on ramps, just as there are in a highway system. So women could finish their educations or continue them when it made sense in their domestic lives for them to do so. When she was at Douglas, she designed a small but very successful continuing education program, but she had grander ambitions. She was going to a lot of conferences during this time. There was a lot of discussion um, about women's education and higher education in the 1950s and a lot of different ideas about how to do it better. In 1960, when she was appointed president of Radcliffe, she finally had the resources to test her hypothesis about female genius. She designed the Radcliffe Institute. This was a fellowship program that would offer 20 women office space, access to Harvard's labs and libraries, and a stipend of $3,000, about $30,000 today, to spend as they wish. And she fundraised aggressively to get the money for it, since the Radcliffe Corporation, the college trustees essentially, was too skeptical to fund the program. To apply to the Institute, you needed to have a PhD or the equivalent, an artistic accomplishment. News about the Institute went out in November of 1960. It was on the front page of the New York Times. It was in newspapers all over the country, and the response was intense. Letters came in from all parts of America, from women who had PhDs and women who had only a high school education. The phone rang so much that Bunting hired another administrative assistant to field all of the incoming calls. All of them expressed interest and enthusiasm and wanted to know how they could apply. 
Like Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, which would be published a few years later in 1963, the Radcliffe Institute spoke to a deep, unnamed need in American women. One sort of uh, aside is that when I was researching this, I had not known that Betty Friedan had had a collaborator on The Feminine Mystique, and it was Polly Bunting. That the two of them had met through a mutual friend um, who knew that both of them uh, were thinking about women's lives and ambition. She put them in touch. And for a few weeks, Fernand would take the train from Rockland County, New York, down to um, New Brunswick, where Bunting was, was working in her office, and they would try to collaborate on this book. The collaboration was ultimately not successful. According to Bunting, Friedan was a more uh, fiery and angry presence <laughs> than, than she herself was. She considered herself a real moderate. So they ended up going their separate ways. Friedan went on to write her book, and Bunting went on to, found, went on to find, found this program. The Institute opened its doors in the fall of 1961, and it existed as a women's only institute until 1999, the year Radcliffe formally merged with Harvard. The five women artists and writers in my book, who jokingly called themselves the equivalents after the Institute's application requirements, only overlapped in Cambridge for one year, 1962 to 1963. But some were friends before the Institute, and they all remained close afterward. They read and edited each other's writing, illustrated each other's books, wrote poems in response to paintings, and made paintings in response to poems. They offered each other the kind of support and even criticism that it was hard for women artists to find then, and that can be still hard for them to find now. I should emphasize that although all of these women were mothers and artists, they were actually quite different from each other. Sexton was a wasp from family wealth from New England. She was tempestuous and mercurial, a real natural poet and a passionate performer. Um, some of you may know the story of how she came to write poetry, which was um, after experiencing postpartum depression, she, a therapist recommended that she start uh, watching educational programming. She saw a special on PBS about how to write a sonnet and thought, that sounds interesting. Maybe I'll try my hand at that. Wrote a sonnet, wrote another one, and found that writing was very therapeutic, but also just really interesting. It kind of activated some of her... Um, you know, uh, skills and kind of, uh, she really enjoyed playing with language and rhyme and she loved the kind of puzzle of poetry. And really within, I think, you know, she started writing poetry in 57 and by 59 she had a published book. So she had a really uh, quick rise in the poetry world. Her best friend was Maxine Cuman. Um, they were also longtime collaborators. Cuman was a Jewish woman from Philadelphia, a self-described pawnbroker's daughter. She was studious, charming, a bit reserved, and a caretaker. She and Sexton complemented each other, both temperamentally and poetically. Olson, a writer with whom Sexton struck up a correspondence before they met at the Institute, was older than the other women in my book. She was 50 when she arrived at Radcliffe. She was a leftist and a radical, a political organizer, and a working class mother living in San Francisco, San Francisco who struggled to find time to write. She worried that her best years as a writer were behind her. Swan, like Sexton, was from Massachusetts. She was self-liberated, in the words of her daughter. She hadn't needed to wait for women's liberation. She had pursued an adventurous and somewhat bohemian artistic life in a time when few women did so. After she earned her degree at the, museum, uh, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, she went off on a traveling fellowship to France and lived with several men and you know, spent, her, spent her summers painting in the south of France. And this was not you know, sort of the typical path for a woman of that moment. As a painter, she crossed paths in the relatively small Boston art scene with the sculptor Mariana Pineda who was newly arrived in the area with her husband, the sculptor Harold Tovish. Pineda was from Evanston, Illinois, from a wealthy family, and she'd been pursuing sculpture since her teens. She was a gentle presence, but as her student evaluations attest, she was also a perfectionist who held herself and others to high standards. So this wasn't necessarily a natural friend group. I don't know that if these five women had met each other out in the world, they would have become fast friends, I guess Cuman and Sexton accepted. But as artists at the Institute, they really recognized each other's talent and their desire. They found mutual understanding and mutual support. During the years that the, the equivalents met and befriended each other, the United States went through profound social and political changes. In the 1950s, when my book begins, a new social conservatism reign, raged. Norms were policed, neighbors were surveilled, 
The nuclear family was idealized, as the historian Elaine Tyler May has argued, both the family and the home were seen as fortresses. They were symbols of American freedom and prosperity and bulwarks against communism. The equivalence generation was the most marrying generation on record. The average age for marriage for women was 20 and 96.4% of, uh, of women married. Divorce rates dropped, fertility rates soared. Jobs were advertised by sex and pay was far from equal. It makes sense that many women imagined fairly constrained lives for themselves. As Sexton once said in an interview, life would take place behind little white picket fences. But by the time my book ends in 1974, a series of social movements had changed nearly everything, including the ways that women move through the world. Civil rights, the student movement, women's liberation and queer liberation had changed both policy and social practice. Birth control had been legalized, as was abortion. Title VII and Title IX offered women legal protection against discrimination at work and at school. Organizations like the National Organization for Women pressured Washington and organized demonstrations in the streets while well, radical feminist organizing selves questioned heterosexuality as well as the necessity of giving birth. A young creative woman coming of age in the early 1970s encountered, encountered a very different world and far fewer barriers than the women at the center of my book. With the exception of Olson, who was a lifelong political activist, the equivalents witnessed women's liberation but were not quite part of it or themselves changed by it. But part of what I suggest in my book is that the art they made about women's lives, and in particular about motherhood, helped generate the changes that took place in the 1970s. Barbara Swan drew and painted portraits of her young children and of a nursing mother. Trained in German Expressionism, she depicted the surreal quality of motherhood. Pineda made life-size sculptures, including sculptures of pregnant women, and even one prelude of a woman in labor. Pineda had been told by her male teachers that she would stop making sculpture when she had children. Instead, she used the experience of becoming a mother to jumpstart her career. She broke taboos about what kinds of bodies could be represented in the fine arts. Likewise, Sexton's so-called confessional poetry about menstruation, abortions, suffering from mental illness, and even wearing a girdle, broke taboos about what could be represented in lyric poetry. Though Sexton never identified as a feminist, she actually hated having her poems included in a feminist anthologies, her poetry, like Sylvia Plath's, was nonetheless galvanizing for a generation of young women. Cuman and Sexton also wrote about motherhood, and Olson's theory of inequality in the literary world, a theory she actually generated at the Radcliffe Institute, would shape feminist criticism and the teaching of college literature for decades. So I guess part of what I'm arguing, and this is maybe obvious, but I think still always needs to be said, is that social and political change don't come from nowhere. There are usually people thinking, writing, organizing, experimenting, before any visible upheaval occurs. The equivalents and the other women at the Radcliffe Institute were laying the groundwork for what was to come. So why did I write this book? As someone who is not around for this period in history, as someone who came of age in a really, really different historical moment, especially a very different moment for women. So I have a few different answers to this question. And the, I guess there's a story kind of behind here that is in some ways a fairly simple story. I came across the Institute when I was a graduate student at Harvard, and I was working on a PhD in English. I'd become very interested in Tilly Olson. I'd read her story, I Stand Here Ironing, which is a dramatic monologue spoken by a working class mother who feels that she has not adequately parented her eldest child. She needed to work to support her family and was often outside the home. And in the story, she's literally doing the family ironing and reflecting on mistakes she had made or things she wished she could have changed. It's a really, really beautiful story. And the more I learned about Olson, the more I wanted to know. The child of Russian Jewish immigrants, she was an organizer, she was a member of the Young Communist Party. Uh, she was an, or an, or an organic intellectual and also a formally experimental writer. I was interested in her because of the way she exhibited modernist sensibilities in her writing, as well as intense leftist political commitments. In the 1930s, these things were seen as uh, a pose, that if you were a real leftist and you were committed to making literature accessible to the people, you couldn't write in a difficult way or an innovative way. You had to write in a really straightforward way, but Olson took a really different approach. I was also interested biographically in how she negotiated the competing demands of wage earning, child rearing, and creative work. At some point I learned that she had spent time in Cambridge, which was very convenient for me because I was living in Cambridge. And I was able to walk over to the Schlesinger Library of Women's History to read up on her time at this place called the Radcliffe Institute. 
So at the time, I was familiar with a version of the Radcliffe Institute. Um, I'd been working and teaching at Harvard for a while, and I knew the Radcliffe Institute as a fellowship program, as well as the library, and a few other kind of administrative offices. So I wasn't exactly sure what it would have meant for Olson to spend time at a place like this. So one day, I walked down Garden Street, walked over to Schlesinger, and requested the archives with the Institute. As I started reading these records, I learned that there had been an earlier version of the Radcliffe Institute, one that was exclusively for women, particularly for women who had married and had children, who had really intense family commitments, and who needed some additional institutional support in order to continue their academic or creative careers. Looking at some of the other names from the early years of the Institute, I recognized many writers that I admired, Sexton, Cumin, Alice Walker, Denise Levertov. I was intrigued by the fact that this institution had brought together many successful and innovative women writers and artists, and I wanted to know more. I wanted to know what it would have been like to have spent time in this community at this moment in history. One of the reasons this appealed to me is because I was intrigued and have always been kind of intrigued by the idea of creative communities. So by creative community, I'm thinking of everything from the transcendentalists of Concord to the Bloomsbury Group of London to Black Mountain College, where dancers and musicians and poets and writers all came together to experiment. Uh, I was interested in these communities, not just because of the gossip, although there's always plenty of that, but also because I think they change the way we think about the artist. So we often think of an artist or a writer as a kind of singular genius locked up in a study somewhere, communing with the muse, but as many of us know, this is usually a myth. Almost every artist requires the support of many other people, be they editors, assistants, typists, and quite often, wives. This is one reason historically that fewer women than men have made, had, have made names for themselves in the arts. They have not had access to the institutional or domestic support that male artists have. As someone who's committed to various kinds of collective politics, I think it's important to emphasize that art, too, is a form of collective experience. And I think that by acknowledging the kind of support needed to make art, we can develop better institutional support that allows more people to pursue creative ambitions. So that's the intellectual reason for my fascination with the Institute. But there are also, as always, a couple of personal reasons, which had to do with where I was in my own life as a young woman. I was in my late 20s at the time when I started researching this project. And I was feeling very anxious, honestly, about many things, but particularly about the prospect of motherhood and family making and what these things would mean for my intellectual work, which at the time I saw as the fullest expression of my true self. And I had some reason to worry. My mother, who was not of the equivalence generation, but rather the next generation, had given up a political career to raise me and my siblings, and she had always regretted it. When I was a small child, I felt terribly guilty, like I had ruined my mother's life and taken away the work that made her feel most like herself. As I got older, I realized it was a more complicated story, and it almost always is, but I still worried about failing a potential child as well as failing myself. I also happened to be living in what seemed to me like an ideal domestic arrangement, one that I also knew could not last. At the time I started researching the book, I was living in a rundown house for which I was definitely paying too much rent, with a group of other women, all of whom were writers or academics. It was a wonderful and intense household. We were very supportive of each other and also very attuned, perhaps too attuned to each other. We were a little bit competitive, a little bit scared of each other, and also very, very close. I loved living with these other women despite the challenges and I worried about what was going to happen to us. I expected that eventually everyone would split off, partner up, have children, form families of their own. I wondered if our current experience could ever be recreated later in life, and I became curious about how women have made room for intimate friendships despite any other commitments. I should say that as a writer, I almost never write about myself. I am pathologically incapable of doing so. So instead, I have a trick, which is that when I'm wrestling with some kind of personal difficulty, I turn to something in literature or history and I write about that. This allows me to think through a problem in my own life by seeing how other writers, thinkers, and artists have reckoned with it. So those are the reasons that the Institute appealed to me as an area of research, both the intellectual reason, my interest in creative community and how attending to it changes our conception of the artist and the writer, and my personal anxiety, being a woman in my late 20s and wondering what was going to happen to my creative life and my social life if and when I formed a family of my own.
I wish I could say that I started writing the book right away, that I was full of fire and excitement, but I actually had to write a dissertation, which was not on this topic. So I went and did that. And then I also started at the same, around the same time writing for magazines. I wrote essays, criticism, book reviews. And in my magazine writing, I found myself coming back to this particular moment in history, the mid-century, the 1950s and the early 1960s. And I knew that I wanted to revisit the Radcliffe Institute and write about the circle of women. When I finally had the chance to work on a longer project, that's what I did. So my question and my challenge as a researcher and a writer was how best to capture the equivalence time at Radcliffe. I had training in archival research, and I knew that one important way to do this was going to be to look at documents. Letters, photographs, journals, budgets, application materials. But I also knew that one of the challenges of archival research is that there's so much that's left out of the archive. Records can be illuminating and full of information, but they can also be impersonal or partial or misleading. Think about the last email you wrote to someone. How much does it reveal about you, about your emotional state, your values, your life? This is always one of the great challenges of writing about history. How do we understand and then recreate a moment for which we weren't present? Luckily, the wonderful archivists at Schlesinger helped me take advantage of a key source audio recordings of seminar presentations given by Institute Fellows. Beginning in February of that first year, so that would be February of 1962, the Fellows presented their work in progress at brown bag lunches on Tuesday afternoons in the living room at 78 Mount Auburn Street, which is where each Fellow had an office. There were some shared drinks and sometimes some shared baked goods. The atmosphere was fairly casual. And I was able to listen to these recordings, starting with a joint presentation from the poets. Sexton and Cumin. At the time that I was researching, the recordings were not yet digitized, so librarians brought out a uh, tape player, a big boom box, the kind I had in my, in my room when I was 10 years old, and I hooked up some headphones. I was sitting just a 10 minute walk from where these women had gathered 50 years ago. I hit play, and I heard the director, Constance Smith, ask everyone to quiet down. She said, we're certain that we're recording history. This was a transporting experience, exciting and even a little eerie. It was as if I were in the audience on that February day, listening as Cumin explained the structure of a sonnet, as Sexton made many self-deprecating jokes. I could hear the tone of Sexton's voice, the quality of Cumin's laugh. I could hear awkward silences, the lines that got laughs from the audience, glasses clinking, the rustling of clothes. Listening, I felt that I was able to understand the tone or the atmosphere, what my undergraduate students would call the vibe, of the Radcliffe Institute in the early 1960s. What I realized as I listened was that these women were able to regard each other across differences, often differences of discipline, interest, background, with a kind of sympathetic attention. They were genuinely curious about each other's work, and they were eager to hear what the other had to say. This informed the way I wrote their story. It also presented a challenge. Knowing that the Institute was generally a positive experience for the women present made me wonder how I could tell an exciting and dramatic story about it. Conflict is really the engine of narrative. Most stories pit a protagonist against an antagonist, human or otherwise. The equivalents certainly had their obstacles, cold mothers, money worries, a culture that devalued women, but the Institute itself was basically good for all of them. There was a lot of sharing and supporting, and not that much grousing or competing. I had to figure out then where the drama of the story might lie. And what I realized as I researched and wrote was that the obstacle, or the antagonist, was time. The Institute was a temporary arrangement. Each fellowship only lasted for two years. The five women in my book overlapped for a single year. As good as the Institute was, it was impermanent. As I wrote, I tried to capture the excitement of this moment, as well as its ephemeral quality. Here was something new and meaningful, but when it ended, everyone would have to make her own way alone. In this way, for me, writing the equivalence was a way of grappling with the ending of my household of friends, or perhaps not its ending, but its transformation. My house of friends couldn't go on forever, but in a way, this made our arrangement more meaningful rather than less. I once had a professor who always said that beauty is contingent on its disappearance in the same way that life is made meaningful by its end. And I thought of this as I listened to the Institute's tape recordings, which eventually ended leaving me alone in silence. <laughs> 
time and permanence endings, these themes all point to the third topic of my talk, which is the approach I take to writing about the past. I referred to myself earlier as something of a historian because I was not trained as a historian. I'm not a professor of history. Nonetheless, my approach to understanding literature has often required an understanding of history, both the personal history of a writer, their biography, as well as the situations and contexts in which their life and work took place. Thus, my approach to writing history, when I first started to do it, was to see events from the perspective of my subject. How did they think about literary value, or authorship, or gender, or difficulty? Uh, I've heard this approach sometimes referred to as following your actors. You're trying to track ideas and the circulation of those ideas at a particular moment in time, rather than evaluating those ideas from a present perspective. I think there's a lot to be said for approaching the past in this way. It's a humble approach and a sympathetic one. It avoids the hubris that can plague some historians, by which, I mean, by which I mean a tendency to conclude that we can understand those who lived before us better than they could themselves. It also helps you avoid unfair and unnecessary critique. I have a friend who's a professor of history and he likes to tell his students, if you were the person in that situation, you would be the person in that situation. This can sound like a Zen koan, but I think what he means is that we have often have a tendency to imagine that if we lived at a different moment in time, we would be us just in that other moment in time. We would care about the same things, think about the same things, but in fact, personhood is shaped by historical moments, by social and political forces, and we would actually be very different people if we lived at a different moment in time. It's easy to imagine that you would behave nobly and heroically against uh, various injustices, but the odds are, at different moments, you would have accepted things like everyone else did. This approach can also produce a more immersive and seamless account of a particular historical milieu. Rather than measuring something like the Institute by today's standards, we take it on its own terms. We experience it as the fellows did and find the meaning that they drew from it. I like to think of this approach as fundamentally sympathetic an effort to bridge temporal distance and generate understanding. But there are also limits to this approach. It can be uncritical, biased, unduly celebratory. From my 21st century vantage point, I couldn't help but notice some of the Institute's blind spots, at least in its early years. Bunting wanted to effect change by assisting the most accomplished women. These were, almost by definition, also the most privileged white, fairly well off, highly educated. In order to pursue a PhD or a career as a writer or artist, one needed to have money, to go to school, to secure housing, to hire household help and childcare. The Institute was looking for women of talent, as one newspaper headline had it, but to the admissions committee, talent meant credentials. With the exception of Olson, who challenged this conception of talent, the Institute did not admit working class women. In fact, 14 of the inaugural fellows were married to members of the Harvard faculty. Yes. Harvard, not necessarily known for its uh, you know, equal and open um, hiring practices. To say that the early Institute fellows were comparatively advantaged isn't to say that they didn't face discrimination. They certainly did. This was a time before married women could open credit cards in their own name or bank accounts before coeducation hit the Ivy Leagues, before marital rape was even a legal concept. But if we learned anything from the feminist thinkers in the 1960s and 1970s, Betty Friedan, Audre Lorde, Shulamith Firestone, Adrienne Rich, it's that women are not a monolith. Class, race, sexuality, ethnicity shape one's opportunities just as gender does. Women are not all oppressed or advantaged in exactly the same ways. It seemed to me that in order to tell the story responsibly, I needed to note the limitations of the Institute as an emancipatory project. I needed to note its whiteness and to describe the student movement comprising black Harvard and Radcliffe, Radcliffe students that eventually got both colleges to diversify. Likewise, I needed to note that when Institute fellows used their stipends to hire household help and childcare, they were often hiring women of color who were not among those women Bunting envisioned herself helping. I needed to note that stipends did not take into account financial, financial need, at least not formally. Olson managed to secure extra funding given her ex economic circumstances. To describe the Institute as liberating for women without pointing out that at first it only addressed the needs of specific women would have been dishonest. Um, I teach biography writing 
to students, and I always joke that what I have done in this book is going to please no one. Um, that often people who live through the historical moment question will find these kind of criticisms sort of unfair. That it, I have the advantage of looking back after years of thinking and arguing about these kinds of issues and pointing out these sorts of errors, while people in the moment who are kind of grappling with these questions are basically doing the best they can to make an effect change. And of course, those who come of age in later moments take great pride in rejecting the past wholesale. My undergraduates uh, have no time for second wave feminism or even third wave, third wave feminism. Um, you know, it's often said that the generational struggles in women's history bear some similarity to fights between mothers and daughters, which can be vexing and continuous. The result, from my perspective, is a lot of errors, misunderstandings, and a kind of constant reinventing of the wheel. I'm always surprised to learn that my undergraduates firmly believe that the women's liberation was composed entirely of white women, and that no one ever thought about the intersections of gender and race and class until roughly 1989. But as the saying goes, when we forget the past, we tend to repeat it. As I was writing this book, I read and watched debates about gender and consent and workplace discrimination and the unequal distribution of household labor and heard echoes of the same conversations on the very same topics from 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. This is not to say that nothing has changed or that no progress has been made. I did not grow up like Anne Sexton, although I did grow up quite near her. I did not think my life would be lived behind a white picket fence. As a girl in the 1990s, I was told I could do or be anything. And of equal importance, I was told that no one had a right to do anything to me that I didn't like. I attended a college that I couldn't have in 1960. I enrolled in a graduate program where the majority of students were women. Since then, I've watched my female friends succeed in industries formerly hostile to women, academia, medicine, the law. And I've watched as, as they've had children and shared childcare duties with their male partners almost as a matter of course. The resonances I detect between the mid-century and my own moment only indicate that there are enduring challenges we face in our struggle for gender equality. The pay gap still exists, as does social pressure to be a certain kind of woman or a certain kind of mother. Childcare is still criminally expensive. Abortion and other forms of reproductive health care are uh, inaccessible for too many women in this country. Too many women are poor. They're working too many jobs to try to support their families, and maternal mortality remains too high. My small hope is that a book like mine, which returns us to an earlier moment without asking us to become of that moment, might remind us of arguments and achievements that could have meaning in our own time. It might even suggest new, messy experiments that could be tried today. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm very happy to take your questions.